lecture in our inaugural STEM lecture series. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Justin Topp. I'm the Assistant Dean of Science, Technology, and Math, and Associate Professor of Biology and Bioengineering here at Endicott. Um, this is the second lecture. The first lecture was given by Bob Langer, uh, David H. Koch Institute Professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering at MIT. And um, if, if you weren't here, it was, it was a really, really good talk. We, had, we have a YouTube video of it. <laughs> If you Google or if you search Robert Langer Endicott, it's the first video that comes up. So I really encourage, uh, encourage you to, to watch that. Uh, it, it was basically a tour of what his lab has done over the last 30 plus years in developing the field of bioengineering. Tonight we have George Conadaris, director of the Intelligent Robot Lab and assistant professor of computer science at Brown University. And Dr. Hank Fields can introduce him in, in just one minute. I just wanted to tell you about the other two talks that are part of this series. Uh, on February 15th, we have Sarah Lewis. She's uh, an evolutionary ecologist and professor at Tufts. She'll be giving a talk on firefly science and wonder. Uh, she's given TED Talks before. She's written a popular trade level book. I think it's going to be a really engaging talk. And then in April, we have Nima Degani. Um, he has both MD and PhD degrees, and he's a computational and theoretical neuroscientist. So he's going to be talking about a systems perspective um, in, in neuroscience. Um, before we, before I turn over to, to Hank, I just wanted to thank a lot of people who have made this event and lecture series a possibility. Uh, many thanks to Amanda Finnegan. She's down here. She pushed play on the thing, and now she's down here. Um, she's the academic coordinator for the School of Arts and Sciences, and without her, the logistics of this never would have happened. I want to thank Dean Gene Wong and uh, the Vice President of the College, Laura Rossi Lee. They helped to fund uh, to fund this this series, and I want to thank the faculty committee. So this was. I had a vision for a STEM lecture series, but then I pulled together a committee of faculty to help identify some really, really great speakers. And so we have faculty in every department within STEM here that, that has played a role. And I, I've been asked sort of why, why we started this STEM lecture series, okay? And, I, and last time I gave this, this introduction about how the North Shore is a great place to do science, right? And I think we saw that. And so, I wanted to give you a little, a little uh, overview of, of what I think we can get out of these talks. First, the groundbreaking discoveries that are being made you know, in this building within this area at Brown in the greater Boston area. So not only are the great discoveries here, this is the opti optimal location to be a scientist in my mind. I'm from Iowa, right? This is optimal, that's not. Okay, this is a really, really good place to be an undergraduate student doing science. The other uh, thing that I wanted to, to stress with this lecture series is the role of collaboration. Every one of the talks that you've seen uh, or will see is multidisciplinary, involves a lot of people. And uh, that, that's where science is right now. We've got big problems and projects that need a lot of different people to weigh in, all right? 
And the last thing I want to highlight is STEM is interdisciplinary. You know it's, it's science, technology, engineering, and math. It is interdisciplinary at heart. And so we've chosen four lectures that we thought would really, really get at that well. Have you guys noticed the pattern in this? Cubs in seven. And we should be done before the first pitch as well tonight. So with that, I'll let uh, Dr. Field introduce our speaker for tonight. Hi, everyone. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce George Conanderas. Um, George uh, uh, is uh, kind of an interesting uh, uh, for one of our speakers. He's actually studied on three different continents. So he started uh, in South Africa at the University of Wittenberg. Uh, he then went on to his master's at the uh, University of Edinburgh in Scotland. Um, he did his PhD work at UMass Amherst, which is where I had the privilege of knowing him. Um, he then did a postdoc at MIT, so ties in a little bit with our first speaker, um, Bob Lander, uh, who's also at MIT. Um, he was down at Duke for two years as an assistant professor and is now um, up at, uh, at um, Brown University, um, where he's the director of the Intelligent Robot Lab. Um, he also last year got the DARPA Young Faculty Award, um, which is an awesome privilege. Uh, to have. So um, without further ado, I'll thank George for, for coming to give us this talk and uh, let him let him underway and we got a little present for him. Thanks. Right, sure. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me, and, uh, and thank you for the gift and a kind introduction. Um, so, so, uh, so, as Dr. Field said, I'm the director of the Intelligent uh, uh, Robot Lab, um, and, and as your, your dean mentioned, science is uh, sort of very collaborative. Right? So, I always start my talk with a list of collaborators. Uh, these are my buddies. So, some of the videos that you're going to see today, uh, I did in collaboration with them. Okay across a wide variety of universities and, and companies. Um, so I just wanted to kind of acknowledge that up front. So, so I start every talk with my happy robot slide. This is my happy robot slide, okay? Um, you, may, you may recognize some of these robots from the news. These are robots that have all been introduced in the last maybe five, well, five to maybe 10 years okay, in, the, in, in, uh, in, uh, in science and technology. So, so you may all recognize uh, quad rotors. Quad rotors are a thing now. Everybody owns one. And they fly around. Uh, one better in my house regularly. Um, these uh, sort of uh, humanoid manipulation robots. Uh, that's the uh, Fetch. Um, this one is from uh, Epson. Are, are robots that have been uh, produced relatively recently for research. Uh, this one is Justin. This is from the German Space Agency. Uh, this one is the uh, R2 from NASA. Um, this one is from Boston Dynamics, produced sort of uh, half an hour from here, roughly. Um, and these are tremendous robots, right? So, so maybe before this happened, you could not. This is like an explosion in the available, uh, in the available quality of robot hardware. This is a sort of huge advance. Right? So, so I was a grad student before these things were available, uh, and the field was bleak. It was very, really an unhappy time. So we finally had access to a tremendous amount of really, really, really capable robots. But the problem is that they're only physically capable. Okay, so a robot like, uh, like the Fetch over here is physically capable of holding down an office job. Okay, if, I was to, if I was to set up a big screen so that I could see through its eyes and a couple of joysticks so that I could manipulate its hands, I could, I could serve as a, as a sort of office worker. So physically we're there. The, the mechanics are solved. Um, but what we, what we have, unfortunately, at the moment is we have a complete lack of understanding of how to develop the software that would allow us to take advantage of the physical capabilities of these robots. Okay, so I always follow up my happy robot slide with my sad robot slide. Uh, this is what robots look like today in, in industry. So what you're going to see here is you're going to see the, the chassis of a, a, a Mercedes-Benz being assembled in a robot factory. Um, so, so that's the chassis. And what you'll see, so one particular thing to look out for is you'll see these kind of little robot fingers come up and grab the chassis. Um, they're doing that because everything has to be in exactly the right place. Okay. So, so this is uh, some robots putting things together. You can kind of see everything gets grabbed. It has to be within a couple of millimeters. Uh, and then this robot over here that's doing some, uh, 
that's doing some um, uh, welding has no senses. They're always repeating the motion blindly. So as if you close your eyes and you did this, except you know that you had a, a, a sort of a welding torch on the end. Right? Um, so so when we see robots deployed in real factories to make stuff happen, what they're doing is they're doing exactly the same thing over and over and over again. And they're doing it down to the millimeter. And, and we have to do that. We have to do that because we don't understand how to interact with a world that changes slightly, or that is more interesting than an exact setup where we have designed an entire factory whose sole job it is is to get all the parts in exactly the right place. This is very disappointing. All right. It's very, very disappointing because we have these cool robots that can do so much more than that. And, the, and what we're using them, you know, we're using them as, as, as tools to just kind of close their eyes and repeat motions down to the So that's where we're at now. That is the state of the art of deployed robots. Uh, and so the question that my lab asks and that I do research to address is, is why are robots so dumb? Right. What can we do to make robots less dumb? What can we do to solve the software problem uh, that is underlying the fact that robots can't do anything more than repeat motions with their eyes closed in the world in deployed situations? Okay, so we'd like to get from the unhappy robots to the happy robots, and this requires a large amount of computer science. So what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to just go, kind of give you a tour through the sorts of things that we do. I'm going to talk about four topics. And, and for each topic, uh, I'm just going to show you some videos and explain why it's interesting and important to think about these topics and how it will bring us from robots that just repeat motions effectively senselessly to robots that can interact with the world in the same way that you do, right? that understand how to perceive the world, that understand how to act in the world, and, and can sort of behave intelligently. So the first topic that I'm going to talk about is motion planning. Um, motion planning is uh, a very simple question. If I have a robot, uh, this one is obscured a little bit by uh, uh, these, these kind of vertical lines. If I have a robot in the start position, like the robot is standing here, and I want to get it to a goal position, like it should be standing over here, and I would prefer that it didn't hit anything in the way, uh, how do I do that? How do I compute this trajectory? So one of the reasons why the robots in factories um, are so uninteresting is because they cannot solve this problem. Now this problem may seem like a really, a really silly thing, but I'll show you in, in just a, a minute a video that shows how likely it is, uh, or, or, what, or how likely it is that you will crash into stuff if you don't do motion planning. So the solution to a motion plan looks like this kind of movement over time, right? It's a trajectory through space. If I wanted to start over here, and I wanted to move over there and pick up that uh, pointer, I need to do this, pick it up, there's a trajectory that I'm aiming to find, and that trajectory involves me not smashing my, my own body into any of the things in the environment. So you do this trivially. Humans can do this uh, in on the order of 50 milliseconds. Okay. And the reason that you can do it on the order of 50 milliseconds is that there's a chunk of your brain called the cerebellum that does that for you. Okay. It processes uh, what, what, what's happening in the world around you, and it generates motions that don't result in collision. Well, we don't have that, we have to build it for them. So, so what does a planned motion look like? All right, there's a robot in my lab, and I've asked it to pick up this green bottle. It's got a little handle, it's kind of hard to see because it's dark in there. It's got a little handle that can grab a bite. So if you, if you take this robot and you ask it to do, a, to do the motion naively, if you, if you sort of close its eyes and say, please pick up the bottle, um, and we've tried this, there are at least seven ways that it can smash into the, into the cupboard. The most obvious one is that the cupboard is here in front of it, and it moves its arm directly to where it needs to go and smash into the side of the cupboard. It can also hit it from the bottom, it can uh, hit this thing from both sides, and uh, here is a plan motion. Um, you'll see that when it reaches for the, top of, uh, uh, for the top of the bottle, it narrowly misses that kind of light bulb that's at the top of the, of the cupboard. So this is the kind of motion that you do every day. Uh, and the reason that you need to do motion planning is because every time you encounter your cupboard to pick something out of it, you're in a slightly different spot. You can't just repeat the same motion over and over again. Sometimes you're over here, and sometimes you're over here. And sometimes the thing you want to grab is a little bit further away or a little bit closer. <coughs> sometimes there are cans in front of it, and sometimes there aren't. Okay, so you need to actually be able to, on the fly, uh, generate um, motion 
that doesn't crash into all the things in front of you. Uh, and and so something like pulls out the thing that you're looking for. So, so one of the things that my lab has done is emulating the cerebellum, we've actually built a specialized piece of circuitry uh, that does motion planning. So um, I'm going to give you a quick tour of the technology underlying that. It's the most technical part of the talk, but it's all just diagrams. The rest, the rest will be videos, so um, we'll have more fun afterwards. Uh, but the idea here is that what we can do is we can, we can take the space of places the robot can, can be, the space of poses of the robot's body, and we can break that up. We can, we can choose points in that space, and we can build a graph. So this is a, this is a graph. Imagine that it's, on, it's a sort of 2D graph. Uh, and every node in this graph is a pose of the robot, is a particular spot. And every edge in this graph is a movement between those two poses. Okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to build this graph as if the robot had nothing around it. We're going to build a very large graph. This graph will have 100,000 nodes, but the one I'll show you will have 10, uh, because 100,000 is, well, will take me too long to draw. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to build this graph, and then when we want to make a movement, we're going to identify the node closest to the robot's current pose. So maybe there's a node over here, and, and this, is, this is your current pose, and there's a node over here, so that's close enough. And we're going to identify the node closest to the robot's goal. And we're just going to delete the edges. Remember, that's the swift movement through space. We're going to delete the edges that correspond to the movements that would result in a collision. Okay? So imagine we have these obstacles in the environment, and they correspond to a shape, to a there's, a, there's a weird geometry thing happening. We're projecting these objects into the space of the joints of the robots, and we're finding the selections of joints that collide with the objects, and we're just going to delete those edges. And then what we have is we have uh, a collision-free graph, and we just find a path through that graph. Okay, so uh, the, the downside of doing this is that this collision detection, for every graph, in, uh, for every swept motion in the graph, you have to compute a collision detection, and that takes seconds. Okay, so the, the robot video I showed you in the beginning, um, that actually took 10 seconds to compute that motion before I started the video. So I cheated a little bit. That is one of the reasons that robots that are deployed in factories don't do interesting motions. Everything has to be in exactly the same spot because we pre-guaranteed that that spot has no collisions, that that particular trajectory has no collisions. So we have to solve this problem uh, where we need to be able to do this faster and we have identified that the collision checking, the deleting of those edges, is 99% of the computational cost. So what we did is we developed a, we, we went back to Computer Science 101. We said, okay, what's the fastest way to do something? The fastest way to do something is to do it with a um, and the great thing about circuits is that you can run them in parallel. That is, if you have one circuit that computes one function and another circuit that computes another function, you can run those two things simultaneously, literally at the same time. Uh, so what we, what we do is we, we take these swept motions through space. We build a circuit that computes whether or not an obstacle collides uh, with that swept motion. And we build one for every edge of the network, and we run them all simultaneously in parallel. So what we do is we first discretize the space uh, into, into voxels. That's a 3D pixel. And then when we have a motion, we write down all the voxels that that motion crashes into. This is just a, a discretization of, of that motion. And then each of those voxels has a coordinate in space. Right? So this voxel might be 10 across, 5 down, 3 deep. We can write that down as a Boolean number. Uh, and we can, and, and then that big expression is, uh, sorry, a binary number, and that big expression <coughs> is an order. That is, if I give you an obstacle at that location, or 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 any of these locations, then you have a collision. And we can take that, uh, uh, that sort of binary uh, description uh, of an obstacle, uh, sorry, of a, of a set of voxels, convert it to a logical expression, and output a circuit. Okay, and what we do is we apply, uh, is, uh, we build an edge detection circuit that says, if you send me all the obstacles you found, 
I will compute whether there's a collision with a particular obstacle, and then I will store that in something called a flip-flop, which stores whether, an obstacle, whether a collision has happened uh, yet or not, and I will store all of the edges where there has been a collision, and I will delete them. And because we're doing this in a circuit, I can do that all in parallel simultaneously. So even though we may have 100,000 such edges, uh, it takes the same time cost as if you had one. Okay, because these are real physical objects, and uh, electricity does our magic for us, and runs at the same time. So to sort of uh, give you an overview of the system, what happens is we have a robot running around in the world. It observes an obstacle. It converts the obstacle to voxel coordinates. It says that there is an obstacle point over there, and one over there, and one over there, and one over there. The one over there is three across, two down, and five forward. Converts that to a binary number. Sends that binary number. We do collision checking in parallel. And at the end, we get a graph with all the collision edges deleted. And we find the shortest path through that graph. OK, so, so that was the technical part. Everything from, from now on is just cool videos. Um, so what we did is we, we, built a, we built a scenario that sort of meant to, uh, meant to like impersonate a factory. Right? One of the most common things that you may wish to do in a factory is pick and place. So you would like to be able to pick up something just, and just move it to a bin. And that sounds really easy. That is the sort of thing that humans do without thinking. It is the sort of thing that toddlers do without thinking. Yeah, but it's the sort of thing that is extremely hard for a robot. So we built an environment where we could just move these obstacles around to test out how well we do, and then put down a children's block as a toy, as a, as a, as a target, and the robot's job is to pick up the children's block and move it uh, back there to the bin. Right? You can imagine if, uh, in a factory where you're getting a bunch of parts, you want to pick them up, and some types want go into one bin, and other types go into another bin. Uh, and then what we do is we take uh, an image that we uh, sent of uh, that table, and we convert it into a bunch of boxes. That's what a voxel representation looks like, right? It's like a 3D pixel. There's a point present there, there's a point present there, there's a point present there, and the rest is empty. And each voxel has a coordinate. OK, so, so let me show you this in action. This is my student, Sean Murray. Um, and what's going to happen is he's going to press this red button, and the robot will only start planning when the red button gets pressed. So remember that the state of the art before this was eight seconds. That is, you would press that red button, and then there would be an eight second wait, and the robot would start to move. With our new special chip, which combines all the wonderful techniques that you learn in computer science, parallelism, circuitry, uh, there's a nice little algorithm attached, and also some graph search, uh, you'll see that that happens instantaneously. Right, so we're planning it takes less than 100 microseconds. It's very fast. <laughs> now, just to prove that this isn't a complete, you know, a fake video, Sean will just move some of the obstacles around. Uh, he, is, he is a computer architect, so he's quite fastidious. They have to be uh, parallel to the uh, axes of the, of the um, desk, but he'll, he'll sort of make up a new random obstacle configuration, put down a ball, a good thing, and then you will hit the red button and it will move. Now the thing is that this is so basic to human movement, the ability to do this, that it's just, it seems kind of laughably trivial that robots are bad at it. But we've actually spent 30 years studying how to make robots do this. And this particular uh, chip is the first time we were able to do it in less than a tenth of a second. So the first paper came out in 1978. Uh, this is a case where it's uh, making a single plan that picks up three objects and drops them off, and there's no discernible delay. <coughs> there are no robots in any factories that are able to do to do tasks like this with obstacles that you can move around and goals that you can move around just yet. And until this year, you were not able to do it in real time, even in a lab. But the trick is the parallelism. That's what your server does. It runs everything in parallel, and therefore you get away with uh, you get away with very fast motion planning. Here's a kind of uh, trick that we did. We actually pushed some 
holes in front of the robot's face. So that's not Stephen Wolf Lloyd Jones asking the robot to find a path around the hole in front of its face and touch that little hole over there, held by my student Yang. She, and you can see we can find relatively elaborate fancy motions also pretty much immediately. So now we're at the point where perception and actually doing the thing is vastly slower than planning, which is where we would like to be. So where does this one come from? All right. If we implement this on a CPU, we get a curve that looks like this. For a particular size graph, it takes, uh, so for a graph of 100 edges, it takes about 1,000 microseconds to do this collision detection. As we increase the size of the graph, we find that the amount of time it requires to compute the collision detection goes up. If we decide to buy a super fancy NVIDIA GPU, which cost, uh, will cost about $5,000, so it must have been nice, um, and, we, and we take advantage of all the parallelism uh, presence in the GPU and write GPU code, uh, and we look everything up just as we did in the, in, in the previous case, we find that we get an improvement in speed, but it's sort of constant. And why is it constant? It's constant because the GPU can do 600 things at the same time. No more and no less. So what we're doing is we're dividing the speed at which this thing happens by 600. But because the speed is going up of the CPU, uh, because the time taken is going up for the CPU, the time taken is also going up uh, uh, for the for the GPU. This is our chip over here. It's a straight line because every edge in the graph happens, executes collision detection simultaneously in parallel. That line is flat. All right, so, so again, motion planning is, is just totally basic to generating movement. Right? It's, it's, you have to be able to compute these motions just to move around in an environment that you have not mapped out to the millimeter. And that's not something that robots can do so far, but we're actually being able to, we've, we've kind of made a few breakthroughs and it looks like we'll be able to do that reasonably in the future. Let's think of something a little bit more high level now. Uh, so we're gonna talk about something called uh, skill acquisition. And the idea with skill acquisition is, is motion planning just moves your body around to a particular goal where you might want it. But you don't interact with the world in a sort of interesting way. In skill acquisition, what we'd like to do is we'd like to identify, uh, retain, and refine interesting ways to interact with the world. So for example, when you walked in here today, uh, what you did was you grabbed the uh, doorknob of uh, the introductory door, and you, uh, the door, sorry, on the way in. You turned it and you pushed it open. That is something that you have done thousands of times before. The first time you did it, when you were a baby, it was very hard. Okay, you had to practice at it. You had to try, try to do a bunch of things uh, and see what worked. But you save that solution in your head. You remember it from now on how to open doors. Uh, and, and you sort of kept it with you. And so there's a bunch of things that this does for humans. The first one is development. When you were a baby, this baby is six months old. It's learning to reach and grasp. This is a motor skill that you had to learn. Every person in this room had to learn that motor skill. You were not born with it. But once you learned it, then you, then you never had to solve that problem again. Right. When you're writing a program and you save a little um, subroutine, for example, uh, the first time uh, you learn to compute um, square root, or say, imagine that you write a piece of code to do the square root of a number. This is a very painful thing to do. It's kind of tricky, so people generally do it once, and then they save it in a library, and they say, I have a square root function now, and I don't need to think about how I do it in the future, I just call it by its name. Okay, so this is called a develop developmental approach. What you're going to do is you're going to acquire more and more competencies over time, and those competencies are going to make you better and better at problem solving. Another thing that this gives you is specialization. So this is David Beckham. David Beckham is a soccer player in America, a football player everywhere else. Um, he happens to be one of the finest practitioners of dead ball kicks in the world. And the reason that he is one of the finest uh, practitioners of dead ball kicks in the world is because he spent six hours a day practicing that. Now, if you think about the game of soccer, there's a lot of stuff that goes on there. Right? A whole game lasts 90 minutes. There might be three or four dead ball kicks in that time. But David Beckham has identified that thing as a thing he would like to be really good at. 
He's pulled it out as a single motor skill, and he said, I'm going to practice this until I'm so good at it, there's no one else in the world who's that good at it, <coughs> who is as good as it as me. Very many people okay, make their livings because they are good at one specific thing, and they've practiced it. They've identified it as interesting. It could be carpentry, could be, you know, being, uh, could be uh, construction, could be any motor skill where they're going to get good at something by practicing. They have to identify that particular chunk of something, uh, and they have to practice it. And the final one uh, is simplification. So, so this is a Rubik's cube, as you all know. But I'll bet that you did not know that there is a community of people out there who practice being really fast at solving Rubik's cubes. These people are called speed cubers. Okay, um, the world record I think is seven seconds on average to solve a to solve a uh, Rubik's cube. All that time is just motor motor movement. There's no plan. There's no thinking about it. And, and the way that these people get really fast is they memorize what they call a book of algorithms. Okay, so, so and a book of algorithms is like a, it's like a collection of recipes. It says something like, if you want to swap uh, this one, uh, this kind of uh, uh, square over here with this square over here without changing any of those squares or those squares, here's a motor pattern that lets you do that. Okay, the most popular book of algorithms contains about 40 such motor patterns. Once you have those 40 such motor patterns, it is intellectually trivial to solve this problem. <coughs> it takes no effort at all. It takes what is a hard search problem. I don't know if you remember the first time you encountered a Rubik's Cube, but it's very hard to solve. But if you identify just the right collection of motor skills, it turns it from a hard problem to an easy problem. So all these things, are done by learning skills. Say, identifying that particular piece of motor pattern is an interesting thing. Saving it in your brain, putting it into a library, practicing it to become better at it, and then using it again the next time you need it, knowing that you can pull that piece of motor skill out and apply it in this particular situation. So one of the things that my lab has been studying is how do we make robots better at problem solving by determining which motor skills they should keep and then having them identify them, pull them out, and save them. So I'm going to show you a, a, a video now uh, of this robot. This is the U-Bot 6. I'm going to put it in a, a, a task. I'm going to make it learn to solve that task. And I'm going to take the solution trajectory and pull out some motor skills from that solution trajectory. Uh, and then I'm going to give it, put it in a second task. And I'm going to evaluate whether it's better at that second task, uh, given that it has these new learned motor skills. So let me just explain this task briefly. This task is called the Red Room, because I'm old enough to have seen Twin Peaks the first time around. Um, and this robot really wants to get out of the Red Room. Okay, so, so what the robot can do is it can approach interesting things on the walls. These things are tagged. They have tags that look like QR codes that say this is an interesting place to be. And it can stick its hand out, and it can move it left, it can move it right, it can move it down, it can move it up. It can lean forward, it can run track it, and it can walk somewhere else. And what it's going to do is, by interactive learning in this environment, it's going to learn that if it goes up to this button and it sticks its hand out and it leans forward and it leans back and retracts its hand, then it's pressed the button. And what pressing the button an odd number of times does is it unlocks this door. There's a little, you can see there's a little lock latch that happens over there. Um, and when the door is unlocked and you walk up to this handle and you stick your arm out and you lean forward, <coughs> Uh, and down, and you lean back and retract your arm, you pull on this little handle. That opens this door, if it's unlocked, and you go through the door and you go and push on the switch, then you get to go home. You get a thousand points and you get to go home. Okay. It's like a little maze that the robot has to solve. But the robot has these very low level motions. It can stick its arm out, it can move them around. And what it's going to do by learning is learn to solve this one. So, it's just sped up a bit because it's boring to watch in real time. <laughs> but you'll see the robot go up to things and try stuff. Right? Trying stuff just like a, a baby learns to you know, figure out what stuff works, or, or um, an animal learns how to get a treat from, uh, from uh, something from a, by solving the task or by doing something that a human likes. And eventually the robot is going to learn. There we go. Let's figure out how to push the button. She's going to pull the handle. Through. Right. So this is the optimal solution to that problem. It takes about five tries to get the best possible solution. 
you can see that uh, um, the robot moving towards the button. This is what the robot sees through each of its two cameras. Uh, presses the button, does a little scan around the room to see what's changed. Uh, oh, in the, in the top right corner, you can see the five learning episodes kind of sped up. Cruises on over to this handle, pulls the handle, that opens the door, and then it goes to the door and presses the, the green button. It's got the optimal solution. It solves this thing. This is the fastest way to get out of this maze, right? You know, just as if you have um, if you have a pet and you teach that pet tricks, the pet learns the most efficient way to get the food from you. It's the exact same process, right? When you're teaching your dog to sit or or to stick out its paw or to dance around, you teach it slowly by giving it rewards what to do. This robot gets a reward by pressing the green the green thing. <coughs> So we can take that solution, this is a kind of drawn on, on, uh, on this, the room, and we can pull out segments of it, like pressing the button. Now remember the robot could always do this, it was always physically capable of doing this, but it had to do a long series of learning to figure out, in the middle of learning, if it went there, it stuck out its arm and leaned forward and leaned back, and then it moved over there and did something else and something else, it could solve the maze. But by extracting this piece of motor skill and saying it was really useful when I pressed that button, and, and it was really useful when I pulled that handle. Uh, and it was really useful when I pushed the switch. It can pull out that piece of motor skill and it can have a new, higher level motor skill, which says, this is how you press a button. This is how you press a switch. This is how you pull the handle. Because that was useful in, in, in solving this maze. Okay, so if we put it in a second maze, if it doesn't have those motor skills, it needs to do learning again, okay? So it, needs, it might go up to this handle and it might stick its arm out and try a bunch of stuff. It has to go through a learning process. It might possibly get bored and go somewhere else. It might, it might decide that nothing's happening here. But in this particular case, we are lucky, and eventually it figures out, uh, by trial and error essentially, what to do. If it has the motor skills, it goes up to the handle and pulls it, because it knows what to do with the handles now. So if we put this in robot in a second room, what's happening in this room is it has to press the, the green button uh, an odd number of times, that unlocks this door. Then it has to press this white button that opens the door, hiding this white button. And it has to go through here and pull the handle which closes the door, re-revealing the white button, presses that white button, and then it gets to go home. What you'll see on the left here is if it had to learn with the same skills as it started up with, it can stick its arm out and go left and right and up and down and lean forward and lean back. And on the right, you'll see with the acquired skills, with the higher level skills of pressing buttons and pulling handles and pushing switches. And if you watch this robot uh, on the left and on the right, this one goes up to things and pushes them. And that one goes up to things and sticks its arm out, moves it left, moves it right, moves it down, tries to do all this kind of long range learning. And of course, if you happen to know how to deal with these objects, you're going to solve this maze faster. You're going to get out of the uh, get out of the horrible second rear room faster than if you didn't. But if you watch the behavior of them, visibly one of them is learning at a higher level than the other. And if we time the amount of time it takes to solve this thing the first time, we find that it roughly halves uh, the amount of learning required. So what we have here is we have an instance of a robot uh, that extracted some skills because they were useful in solving one problem. Save those skills and you went to apply them in the future. Uh, and deploy them to solve a new problem more quickly than it had before. Okay, so it is a robot that is accumulatively learning stuff, is becoming better at stuff over time, which is exactly what we want out of these sorts of things. So one other way that's useful to think about learning uh, is learning from demonstration. Okay, so um, often I can show a robot what to do. It's very hard to program a robot what to do because programming is hard, and ro doing anything on a robot is 10 times harder than doing it on a computer. But it's very easy for me to say, you know what, the way that you make cookies here, let me show you, you pick up something and you, you know, you pick up, you pour the dough into this thing and then you turn it until it gets, it gets uh, sufficiently um, sticky and then you add some chocolate sprinkles. So I can actually, I know what to do, so I can show the robot what to do. So, so one of the other things that we've done is investigated learning from demonstration. So th this is my colleague Scott Kindersmar in the Outrageous Shorts and he is controlling this robot uh, with, a, with an Xbox controller. Uh, and he's just showing it how to get through this little maze. He says that you want to drive up to the thing, and then you would like to push the door open, 
and then you would like to go through the door. Uh, there's a little control panel here that you can't see, and it's the robot's going to go up to the control panel and it's going to push the button. So he's just guiding it in a natural way, as you would expect. Nothing, nothing complicated or difficult. And we can apply the same sorts of skill acquisition algorithms, and we can say, hey, pushing open a door is a useful thing to, for you to have learned. And uh, approaching um, this, this control panel, which is represented by a purple dot, and pushing on it is a useful thing for you to have learned. Now you should be able to repeat those things in the future. Here's another example of that. Uh, this is my colleague, Scott Meekham. Um, teaching a robot how to fill in a census form. So he's doing it by kinesthetic demonstration. He's, he's moving the robot's hand using his own hands, teaching it to pick up this marker and then to check the robot box. With a single demonstration of this, we can replay that task. Even though we move things around, we move the boxes around, the robot is able to replay the motion uh, of picking up and grasping the pen and checking the right box. And the reason that we do it this way is it's much faster than learning. You saw that robot learning, and that took an hour of robot time to learn to solve that task. Whereas I could have shown it immediately. The, the point of learning from demonstration is to have robots not have to learn to do stuff, because learning to do stuff takes a while, and robots frequently break. Another way in which we thought of expanding skills to make them kind of more practically applicable uh, is to have them parameter trucks. So imagine that you are this robot and you would like to play uh, soccer. Okay. Um, you might learn how to kick the ball from over here to over there, and that may take you an hour, because you're a robot, and the robots learn slowly. And then you might subsequently learn to kick the ball from over here to over there, and that might also take you an hour. And then subsequent to that, you might learn to kick the ball from over there to over there. Now, what we would like you to be able to do is we would like you to be able to take those individual experiences and synthesize a general skill that says, I want the ball over there, and produce a policy that gets that for me immediately with no further learning. Okay? You've learned to solve three individual tasks, now interplay between those tasks to be able to, on demand, produce uh, a new kicking skill. So, so here is an example of that kind of learning going on. Um, I apologize in advance for the slight creepiness of this robot. Um, <laughs> no, no, it's, a, it's, an, it's an eye cover. It looks a bit like a baby on a stick, unfortunately. Um, uh, anyway. Um, okay, so, uh, so this is learning to throw stone balls trying to hit this, uh, this target, right? Um, so there we go, we learned to hit one particular target. Uh, now we're trying to learn another target. We're going to skip the learning phase because that takes a while. And the third target, a fourth target, and a fifth target. Uh, and now we can interplay to brand new targets from scratch. It's never seen a, a bottle, sometimes it misses. It's never seen a bottle in that position before or that position before. It's learned a generalized throwing skill. Parameterize the location of the thing it's trying to get. Okay. So a small amount of learning generate, generalizes to a large uh, a number of things. Yeah. And, then, and then we can take those parameter skills and we can do machine learning with them. So here's an example of uh, a, a soccer playing agent, uh, and this is a goalie. And the soccer playing agent is learning to get around the goalie. So it can kick the ball at a particular speed, at a particular angle, and it can dribble in a particular way. And what it does is it learns to kind of go around the goalie, so it's got a clear shot, and shoot into the ball. Uh, this is an example of a robot learning of a, of a software agent learning to solve like a sort of platform game where it can jump a particular height, a particular length, and run at a particular speed, and it's kind of jumping over the bad guys. Right? So, so we can kind of pull out those parameter skills, and then we can learn with them. And learning with them involves choosing which skill to apply, and also which parameter setting. So you're going to choose to jump now, and you're going to choose how far you're going to jump. Okay, so the final thing I'd like to talk about um, is goal-directed high-level planning. So, so what we've done here so far is we've said that robots should be able to move around in the world. That's, that's, uh, that's motion planning. Um, uh, and then they should be able to use that basic ability to move around in the world to learn skills that interact with the world, like kicking a ball, or, or pushing open a door, or, um, uh, or filling in a sense. Now that we've got those skills, what do we do with them? 
well, we could learn to use them, and that takes a lot of time, just like that robot that you saw in the maze. Uh, or we could learn models of what those skills do to the world. If I kick the, a ball in a particular speed in a particular direction, then that ball is going to fly roughly in that speed and at that direction, and it's going to land about that far away. And we can use those things to plan ahead, look ahead inside our, uh, using our, uh, in, inside our heads rather than in the world, and be able to decide what to do. So here's an example of planning uh, in a kind of, this is sort of meant to emulate a warehouse depot situation. So what we've got is we've got, uh, um, these, these robots are going to be put down on the ground a little bit. We've got these boxes. We've got two little robots, and the boxes would like, and the robots would like to go get the boxes and bring them back. It's got to go fetch them. So imagine that they're dropped off. You know, someone's dropping off their UPS, and the robot's going to go get the boxes. Uh, some boxes are small; they can be carried by an individual robot, and some boxes are large, and they require the robot to uh, they require two robots to cooperate. Uh, and so what we can do is we can apply high-level planning to be able to decide what the robot should do in every circumstance. So when the robots cannot communicate, what is the right thing to do? Well, the right thing to do is to send the two robots to different locations. Uh, if a robot sees a small box, it should bring it back. <coughs> if the robot sees a large box, it should get behind the one side of the large box and wait. This is a very sensible strategy that you and I might come up with, but this was, come, this was found with an algorithm, uh, by an algorithm automatically just given a description of uh, this task. Right. So what happens is that the second robot goes to see that there's nothing left for it to do, and if there's nothing left for it to do, it goes back and checks to see if its buddy needs help pushing the uh, second box. That's not super complicated. But now what happens if we give the robots the ability to communicate, but we don't tell the robots what communication means or what they should do when they get a communication? What happens when we plan? And what happens when we plan is the planner invents a language. So this is limited communication. They have to be inside this box and talk to each other. And what will happen here, we've got three robots. This robot sees that there's a, a big box that it needs help with. And it goes and it hangs out inside this waiting area while the other, bo while the other robots finish their, uh, finish their uh, tiny boxes. It's going to wait for one of its friends to come back. And then it's going to transmit a signal. And that signal is something like A. Now, we haven't told it what A means. We haven't told that robot what should happen when it gets the signal A. But the planner has found that A should mean, I need your help, follow me to the left. That's when you should transmit A. And when you receive an A, you should follow that guy to the left and help him move his, uh, move his box along. They've invented a little tiny, uh, a little tiny um, sort of cooperation protocol. Right? They've invented a little mini language that says, when you get an A, that means please follow me to the left and help me with my box. When you get a B, that means please follow me to the right and help me with my box. When you get a C, we can all go home. <coughs> so, so we can plan using these skills, uh, but it's uh, sort of technically somewhat unsatisfying. And the reason why it's unsatisfying is we're still planning using the same set of information. Okay, these robots, we told it, we told them that you're going to be in a, in a depot, and we give them their X, Y, and Z positions, and we tell them whether they can see a box when they can see a box. We have to program all that information in. And that's very abstract information. You can see a box. It's not a thing that naturally occurs to a robot. What a robot gets is an image, which is a giant matrix of red, green, and blue pictures. And we have to program in that, that if you see you know, something about this big and it's brown, then that means it's a box. Uh, and, and it makes us unhappy to have to provide these things to robots. So, so if you were to do planning at the low level of the robot, it would be planning in its sensory motor space. If I see a big, huge image and it contains all these pixels in it, what decisions do I have to make? Uh, and this is something that we would like to avoid. So what we've tried to develop, sort of the last thing that I'm, I'm going to show you, um, is, is, an <coughs> is a way to form abstract descriptions of the state space automatically. Okay, so if the robot sees a big vector of uh, pixels, uh, it should be able to learn that it's important for it to know when it's looking at a box or when it's not. Or maybe it's not important to know that that's a box. Maybe, maybe boxes don't matter in this task. Right? Or maybe walls don't matter in this task. Or maybe, maybe signal A never, never becomes important. Okay. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to, to, to focus on, on, a, on a fact about cognition. The fact about cognition is this. Uh, imagine that you're this robot and uh, 
you have been given the motor skill of moving towards this key, and you have been given the motor skill of picking up that key, and you have been given the motor skill of driving towards this lock, and you have given yet another motor skill of turning the key in the lock. That's a very easy search problem, right? So we might say, hey robot, you could go to all these spots around you, and all these spots around you there, and all these spots around you there, and all these spots around you there. But really what you want to do is go to the key, pick it up, go to the lock, turn the key in the lock. Very easy thing to do. This should not get any harder if we make the state space larger. It should not make it any harder if we, if we make the room larger, right? You still just go to the you go to the lock. You go to the key, you pick it up, and you go to the lock. You put the key in the lock. And it shouldn't be made any harder if we make the robot more complicated. The hardness of this problem has got nothing to do with the robot. There is an abstract way of looking at this problem that is the correct abstract way of looking at this problem. Uh, and we would like to be able to find it automatically. No matter what the robot, no matter what the skills, we would like to be able to extract that abstract representation. So we've developed methods that can do that. And the way that they do that is they take the motor skills that we've learned, uh, and they just execute them a bunch of times, and they observe what happens to the world. So this is a training video. Uh, this is my robot in a, in a particularly interesting environment that I constructed by hand, so I like it. Um, and what you have in this environment is you have a, you have a, a, a cupboard, okay, which has a special handle because the robot's kind of clumsy, so it has to be covered in foam so it doesn't hurt itself. Behind the robot, you won't be able to see it, but there's a switch. Uh, and the robot can turn the switch. It has a motor skill for doing that and a motor skill for doing that. Uh, and it can open the cupboard. It has a motor skill for doing that. Uh, and the switch is connected to a line inside the cupboard. When the light is on, it is so bright inside the cupboard that the robot can't see stuff in the cupboard. It just all looks white. Okay, we're taking advantage of the robot's unfortunate cameras. Uh, but when this cupboard is open, it blocks access to the switch. So the robot has to deal with some logical dependencies. If it wants to, uh, if it wants to switch the light off inside the cupboard to pick up what's, whatever's in the cupboard, it's got to switch the light off before it opens the cupboard. Uh, and finally, there's a cooler, which can also open and close. And there's going to be an object inside either the cooler or the cupboard. And the robot's job is to move it from one place to another. OK, so, so what we're going to do is we're just going to execute motor skills. Uh, and we're going to observe what happens when we do that. Robots are slow learners, so this takes some time. Um, What's happening here, though, is that the robot is learning cause and effect. It's learning what happens when I put down the object, and what happens when I pick it up, and under what circumstances can I pick it up, and under what circumstances can I and can I not see it. It turns out, by the way, that it can't open the cooler when the robot's in it, when the object's in its hand, because it needs both hands to open the cooler. If you watch it open the cooler, it opens it with one and pushes it open with the second. So it is learning the dependencies between what has to be true in order to do something, and also, what happens to the world when I execute a motor skill? We call this a model of the world. What we're learning in this case is we're learning a maximally abstract model of the world that throws away all the details that the robot can see and extracts tiny little concepts like the door is open. When the door is open, I can't see the switch. That is an extraordinarily abstract thing from vision, right? The vision that comes into a robot is a big matrix of pixels. That's all it is. Lots and lots of numbers. The idea that the door is open is actually a very sophisticated thing. Humans do this because humans are smart. But robots, unfortunately, are still dumb. And so we're trying to fix that problem by doing this. So, so this is what the robot sees. The robot sees something called a deck button. It gets a bunch of pixels, and it gets how far away those pixels are. And by observing the changes in the depth cloud, it's learning tiny little representation of the world that looks like that. This is the action to open the cupboard. It says symbol 1 and symbol 3 and symbol 4 must be true. And if those are true, you can open the cupboard. And after you've opened the cupboard, the effect is that symbol 5 is true and symbol 4 is no longer true. Symbol 4, by the way, means the door is closed. And symbol 5 means the door is open. Except I didn't give it that idea. That is an idea that it extracted from the data by executing these motor skills one after the other. Uh, and it takes 67 seconds to do that. So it, we, we want it to do things fast, so we say, uh, we, we say that um, uh, we punish it for every second. We take away a point. Okay, so it's learned both the symbolic vocabulary it should have. It's learned the concept of open and closed. And it's learned a model 
of what you need to be able to execute an action and what happens when you execute that action. Okay, so, so I'm going to show you the robot planning with this symbolic model. And the idea is it's going to start over here. The light's on in the cupboard, so it can't see anything in the cupboard. Uh, and there's an object inside this cooler. And what the robot will do is what you expect. It will open the cooler to get to the object. But then it realizes that, hey, if it picked up the object, it would be stuck because the cupboard's not open. So it goes to the cupboard. And then it realizes if I open the cupboard, I won't be able to turn the switch. So let me turn the switch first before I open the cupboard. Then I open the cupboard. Then I go back and pick up the object. This is called a planning problem. This is not a very hard planning problem. It's not a very hard planning problem when you have abstract concepts like open and close. When you are doing it in the sensory motor space of the, of the robot, it's completely impossible. Here it's going to pick up the uh, green bottle. Everything is brightly colored just to make, make the robot's life easier. It's going to drop the bottle off slowly but surely. Doing motion planning, you see that's why it's so slow. Um, Close the door. Close the cooler. And then everything is everything is well. The object is where you would like it to be to solve the problem that you asked it to solve, and now it can go home. So let's talk about happy robots. <coughs> So the robots that are out there in the world today, with the exception of a couple of Roombas, which sort of do something a bit more sophisticated, are totally automatons. They don't do anything intelligent. They don't do any reasonable movement in the world. They cannot handle environments that change. They cannot make action selection decisions on their own. They close their eyes, and they repeat movements very precisely. There are 100,000 such robots in the world today, and the car that you drive was made by one. But we have such cool hardware now. We have such much more mechanically sophisticated robots. Those robots are capable of doing so many cool things. We just have to be able to crack the software problems that allow them to do it. So we've talked about today motion planning, which just lets a robot generate motion in a world that it hasn't necessarily seen before to the inch. Let's it walk up to a new thing, pick up a bottle without smacking something over. We've talked about skill acquisition, which says when a robot learns to do something like open a door, it remembers that little piece of tiny procedural knowledge, it puts it in a library in its brain, and the next time it needs to open a door, it knows what to do. And not only does it know what to do, but it gets better at it over time. You are much more efficient at opening doors than you were when you were a baby. And the reason that you are is because you've been saving up experiences uh, over and over and over again, and you've been using them to get more efficient at that thing. Uh, and then we talked about learning from demonstration, and the way that I like to think about that is learning from others. The world happens to be full of people who know what to do largely, and it would be great if the robots could learn what to do from those people instead of having to learn them by themselves. Right? It's uh, said that uh, Douglas Adams says that humans are unique in their ability to learn from others and also their disinclination to do so. Okay. Uh, so reluctable robots that can learn from others and are not so disinclined. And finally, we've thought about how once you have this, these motor skills, once you have these abilities to interact with the world in an interesting and useful way, how they induce an abstraction that throws away the complexity of dealing with the world at the lowest possible level and builds these nice little abstract models that we can use to find plans uh, in a much further along the horizon uh, than we would be able to if we had to think about every footstep we take and all the changes and all the pixels in our eyes that will change when we take them. Okay, cool. Uh, so that is what I have for now. Uh, do we have any questions? <laughs> I, I believe a young man had a question. Um, so one of the things I don't do is I don't do very much perception. So generally I code it in that's because it's not. Actually, not for that experiment, I told the robot nothing. 
uh, for the experiments in the beginning, when you saw the robot in, in the maze learning, I told it that this is an interesting thing in the wall and you should try and play with it. Does that make sense? Very good question. Okay. Yes. Oh, my pleasure. So many questions. It's time for me to be quiet. So, so there is actually an area of research called intrinsic motivation, which says that if you've got nothing to do, uh, what action should you choose? Uh, and the actions you should choose are the actions that teach you the most about the environment. So, uh, so there was a very famous experiment by Harry Hollow in the 70s where he gave Mrs. McCarthy's puzzles. And they, they were fed, uh, they were happy, they were not tired, and if you put the puzzle in their cage, uh, they played, played with it for hours until they figured out how it worked, and then they got bored and they left it alone. Uh, and, then, and the intuition there is that there we have a sort of built-in information-seeking uh, drive that when we're not hungry or thirsty or tired, and we've kind of got some time, and we've got a little bit of spare resources, we engage that thing and we learn about the world. Um, and so there's been a lot of research on how to get that in robots. Uh, and there, uh, we're at the point where we sort of know how to think about the problem but we're not at the point where we truly understand uh, how, to, how, to, um, how to build intrinsically motivated robots yet. We have robots that almost look like they're playing, right? So, so, so they, they kind of stop playing with something a little bit, but we're not, we're not all the way there. We're not all the way there on any of this stuff, right? All of this stuff is sort, sort of really fine. So that's a great question. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, I was interested in how you would So what's happening in that case is that we pre-build that graph that I showed you in the beginning. And the graph is a finite thing, and the number of motions that you can take off is not a finite thing. So we pre-build that graph, we build circuitry based on that graph, and then it finds the optimal path through that graph. So it is optimizing, but it's not getting the best possible motion just because there's a finite versus infinite. So, and in fact, that particular, that particular case, we did not build the circuitry, we simulated it on an FPGA. Uh, and we could only simulate about 2,500 edges in that graph, whereas a, a full-size graph would be on the order of 100,000. We can do that on a specialized chip. Specialized chips are expensive, so you know, that will happen in the future. Um, but one of the reasons why some of the movements did not look as smooth as they could have looked, or why they kind of went around a little bit more than they did, is just because the graph is smaller than the would like. Okay, and then I, I have to follow the question. Are, are there positions that you put the target in that would be um, not in that particular case, because you only need to get within a few centimeters. Uh, so, so it depends on um, if there's a region around a goal that is acceptable to hit, and that region isn't a point, it's a, it's a ball, then uh, with a large enough graph you can always hit it. Um, but if it's a point, well if the point then you're both because we can't keep points, points are infinitely mm -hmm. so we can't, can't hit it. So generally speaking, yes, but it depends on the graph. So if you were if you were sneaky, you could look into the graph and see where it had holes and exploit uh, the weaknesses of the graph. And but the probability of being able to do that goes down as the graph gets bigger. Does, does that answer? Yeah, yeah. Yes. So you almost solved the, the point where most people would like to envision robots, I robot model, mm -hmm. where action is for the purpose of humans. So having robots. Hiring, doing laundry, grocery shopping, in the daycare, has to be 
coupled with sort of being able to interact with it in a voice activated manner, sort of like a Siri, mm -hmm. what is the limiting point for you now to allow you to make what you solve with emotion and learning from emotion and doing it with a sort of intelligence sort of interaction? So, okay, so, so two things. One thing is that we're very, very far from, our, from something like our world. What I'm showing you here is, is, is totally like all the stuff came out last year, and it's just scratching the surface of being able to do these. Doesn't mean that we understand how to do them super well, or that I could feel this tomorrow in a robot in your house. It means that under quite limited circumstances, we've just been able to touch it. Right, so so, so there is no reason to be afraid. <laughs> um, uh, in terms of interaction, uh, the question of human robot interaction is a big one. There is a whole field actually called human robot interaction. And, and it turns out to be hard, because when you and I have a conversation, we use these tiny words that contain almost no information. Uh, and the reason that we can do that is because we share a lot of um, background knowledge about the world. Right? So, um, but robots don't have that background knowledge, and they don't necessarily think the way that we do. So they don't jump to the same conclusions that we do effectively. They don't fill in the same blanks. So it's very hard to interact with a robot uh, to get it to ask it to do something uh, and not have to specify absolutely everything about that thing. Can't say you can't say make me a sandwich. What kind of sandwich? Right? And and you want to you know white bread, wheat bread? Do you want to cut it in corners, or do you want to cut it in the middle? Um, do you want me to go? You know, do you want me to make it in this kitchen, or do you want me to go home and make it and bring it to you? There's all these sorts of things where a human just knows what you mean because that's what they would have meant, but a robot doesn't. And so we're actually finding that voice is not the most is not the most effective way to interact with robots. And one of the things that my um, lab is working on at the moment is an augmented reality interface where you, you wear a visor and the visor draws on the world uh, things like the robot's going to pick something up and it highlights that thing in your, in your view um, and then it sort of plays its own trajectory forward before it happens so that you know what the robot's going to do because you would know how a human would go pick up the, you know, if it wants to go pick up the, that coffee cup over there, you know what a human would do but there's no reason to believe that a robot would do what a human would do and often what you find is people walk in the paths of the robots or they, or, they, or they collide with the robot because the robot is behaving in a way that they don't intuitively understand. So actually drawing <coughs> these things on the common world that both the robot and the human can see seems to be the most effective way uh, to do that. Um, yes? Do, do you think the problem is because we, we do programming, which is at the root of this, you know, they're super linear, and our neural net is massive. All connect together to multiple nodes. So when we write our computer program, we can do anything mm -hmm. that we're allowed a number of different algorithms to run, and we just have to have one that becomes our sort of cumulative experience. So, but everybody's program is different. So people used to think that there was a fundamental difference between linear programming type thinking and what happens in the neural net. And it turns out that actually, I mean, we can see that that is false because you can program a neural net. Right. So, so the fundamental difference is not neural net versus programming. The fundamental difference is that humans are like uh, are like balls of putty. They roll around in the world collecting stuff, and you spend your whole life collecting all these facts and all this background knowledge. And there's, well, you also have a bunch of built-in cognitive biases, right? And your your cognitive built-in cognitive biases plus all the little pieces of information you collected over your whole life inform everything that you do. Uh, and robots can't do any of that. They cannot, and even if they did, it's not clear that they would collect the same experiences. They would see the same stuff, and it's not clear that we want them to have the same cognitive biases. So, so, that, so it's like talking to an alien, right? It's, it's much harder than you expect it would be because of all the shared experience that we as humans have with each other that we just don't have with these machines. Does that make sense? Anyone else? Yes? So, so that is it. So, so the first papers that incorporated deep learning in end-to-end -end robot skill learning happened this year. Came out this year, and they sort of they came out in preliminary form last year, but they were officially published this year. And it, it makes things better, but it doesn't fundamentally change what's going on. It, it's just more efficient learning. Uh, it, Deep learning fundamentally changed the way we think about computer vision, but in robotics, uh, it's just kind of it's improved stuff, but it hasn't really. It's just a difference of degree, not of not of type, just yet. Maybe we're missing something. But. 
Yes. Yes. Yeah, and, and well, I mean, so understand is a, is a loose thing, right? Like some of the machine learning techniques I'm, I'm using here, and I can't get it to explain to me what exactly it meant. I can, I can get it to give me a bunch of equations that happen to be, you know, happen to balance to zero, and that's why I chose what I want to do, and there's degrees of understanding. Um, I generally use methods that I at least mathematically understand, because, because then there's no alarms and no surprises. Um, but the deep learning people seem more comfortable with just seeing what happens. Makes me nervous. Yes. Sorry, I'm a mathematician. I'm just curious. Um, what uh, what types of mathematics do you use in the uh, lab? Like, you're about to do more. But... Okay. So there's a couple things. So so in AI and machine learning, uh, probability theory, in particular Bayesian probability theory, is the thing. It is foundational for the way we think about the world, and that's because the world is noisy and quite observable and stochastic, and you need to be able to armor yourself against this thing, right? You don't, your, your sensor values fluctuate all the time, and you don't get to see everything, and your movements might not work the way you expect, so we, probability theory is, the, is this kind of coating we put around everything we do so that it protects us from that. Uh, in robotics, generally, there's a lot of linear algebra and calculus in addition. So one of the things about robotics is that it requires, it's a convergence of all these technologies, and so it requires a lot of, uh, it has this horrible tendency of requiring you to know a reasonable amount about almost everything. Uh, it's programming, it's math, it's theory, there's, I occasionally have to break out a, a solder, which is horrifying. I have to like a solder, soldering iron. Oh, solder. <laughs> solder. <laughs> Sol soldering iron. Yeah. Um, uh, I have to solder things together. I have to break out a multimeter and a voltmeter occasionally, and I need to understand you know, electrical engineering. But I was trained in computer science, and so everything else, I'm, I'm just an enthusiastic hobbyist. Yes. So, so that video that I showed you at the end with the robot planning, yeah. that was a result of three years of work. Uh, and, and when it happened, it was, uh, it was very exciting. Um, so it's like most activities where you get bogged down in the day-to-day -day weeds and, and it just feels swampy, right? You, you're living a day at a time and you've got every little, all these little sub-problems that you have to solve one at one, 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 one a little bit at a time. But when you get to give a talk like this, you can go zoom back out and see the big picture and why this is all important. So actually some of my highlights are talks I get to give places to an audience that has not suffered through the excruciatingness of getting the robot to work and fixing it and, and all the little knives I had to pull to make it happen. Uh, so, so actually the two robot videos, that, the, the robot video in the red room was the end of my PhD thesis. That was a beautiful <coughs> moment. Um, and, uh, and the one right at the end was, uh, I'm very proud of that work, the simple learning stuff. Thank you, that's a great question. Anyone else? All right, thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you.